All right, Bo, you're an established F-16 guy. Yes, sir. In fact, we even had you on the show to talk about air-to-air weapons. But what do you think, percentage-wise and historically, is the greatest threat to you F-16 guys and to us F-18 guys and really all military aviation? I think despite what the movies may have you believe, uh, it's definitely the stuff coming uh, off the ground trying to get me uh, while I'm flying around. Okay, surface-to-air threats, and there's two big categories of those. What are they? Uh, so you have uh, the surface-to-air missiles, all those uh, big you know, flying telephone poles ripping mm-hmm. around the sky. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then you got a little small piece of metal that you pretty much cannot see, AAA. That's right. And so we are starting a two-part series on the next couple episodes on surface-to-air threats and counter tactics. And we begin today with a discussion with retired U.S. Navy F-14 pilot and Top Gun instructor Craig Snyder, who's going to be here talking all about what you just said about anti-aircraft artillery, better known as simply AAA. Hit it. Strap in for the Fighter Pilot Podcast, the internet radio show that explores the fascinating world of air combat, the aircraft, the weapon systems, and most importantly, the people. Now, here's your host, retired U.S. Navy fighter pilot, Vincent Aiello. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. I am your host, Jello, and back this week to lend a hand is Trevor Boswell. You just heard him in the pre-roll there. How's it going, Boat? Hey, Jello, it's going great. Another beautiful day down here in Georgia. Outstanding. I'm actually up in Oregon at the moment, and trees are changing outside. Looks pretty nice. Very nice. And uh, yeah, we've got a discussion here, part one of two on surface-to-air threats. We're going to kick it off with AAA with Crunch in just a little bit. But before, it's not been that long since we've heard or seen you last. What's going on? Well, yeah, no, it's uh, been a few weeks, I guess, maybe a month or so, but uh, not a whole lot for me on the personal side, but my wife was able to finally finish her uh, grad school and certification process in occupational therapy. All right. Has joined the workforce, so that's awesome. I've actually been helping out the podcast a little more than I have in the past uh, with uh, working on Bomber Month, a few episodes there. So I've got one episode in the can, and I uh, record another one uh, this coming Monday for uh, a couple of awesome pretty iconic pieces of aviation uh, history in both the B-25 and the B-29. So looking forward to everybody getting a chance to hear that and what uh, these awesome guests have to say. No doubt. So after our little surface to air threat mini series in November will be bomber month. As you said, last year it was December. We're moving it up to November and we've got three episodes this year and you're going to take two of the Americans. I'm going to take one if we can get it lined up with a Brit friend on the Avro Vulcan. So that'll be a lot of fun. And like last year, we'll probably just go straight to the interview and keep it simple. And hopefully you and I can work on what's coming down the pike after that. Absolutely. Cool. Hey, did you have a chance to catch last week's U2 episode? Man, boy, did I. That was some phenomenal (laughs) stuff. I didn't take a look at how long that thing was before I started listening, but uh, thank goodness I was working on a few other things around the house and uh, had a bunch of time because that ended up being like an hour and a half. And man, I could not tear myself away from it. It was great from beginning to end. (laughs) What an awesome guest and amazing stories he had. Yeah, Lips was a lot of fun, and uh, Fish is good, too. He always shows up and uh, helps with these black jets, as we call them. Uh, We did have some people say the dog didn't bother them. I saw one guy on YouTube who said he had to quit listening because the dog bothered him. Apologies there. When we get to be as big as Joe Rogan, we'll get our own studio, and we can control (laughs) that a little better. I think there's a little bit of dog appearance here uh, coming up with Crunch as well, but it's not as bad. But no, it was a lot of fun. Uh, We also had some people reach out and say, hey, why can't he talk about Gary Powers or stuff all over the internet. And I guess my point to that is when you leave the military, you sign paperwork that says, hey, I'm not going to disclose classified information. And in fact, I remember folks even telling me, if you see it on the internet, don't acknowledge it, don't deny it, don't do anything, just step away. Because if you start wading into that, it gets real messy. And so I'm not going to stand here or sit here or whatever and explain or justify why lips didn't want to talk about certain things but if folks find stuff on the internet hey go for it but you know we're still required to protect certain information oh yeah that's absolutely correct i don't want to touch that with a 10-foot pole (laughs) not that i have any clue as to what you know specifically happened with the gary powers incident but any of the things that you or i were read into while we were on in service is uh classified for a reason and i'm not the one to make the call as to whether it's okay to share it with somebody else for sure that's right 
Well, fair enough. Uh, let's see what else came out of that one. We had a little snafu with our newsletter that usually accompanies our various episodes. And so we ended up sending a second one with a correction for the JJ's pilot supply code. And then as it turns out, we had the wrong link anyway. So head on over to, you can find it in different places, but, uh, we have a fighter pilot podcast or FPP trading post as it's called. It's a Facebook group where people can buy and sell different aviation merchandise merchandise, military aviation specifically. We have the correct link there. I think we've also got it on our regular Facebook page as well as on our Patreon page. And even though our Patreon page is mostly for the folks who financially support the show, we do have some stuff there for everybody, including various discount codes. And so you can go find it there as well. But if I try to write it here or say it here, I should say, then uh, I'll probably just confuse everyone. So probably enough said on that. Let's see, what else is going on this past week? Well, we ran a bonus episode and a giveaway for our buddy Bio, Dave Baronic. He was promoting his latest book, Tomcat Rio. I had a chance to read that. It was really good. And as we're recording this boat, we don't have the three winners identified yet. But uh, as everyone hears it, it'll be over. But you can check out our fighterpilotpodcast.com shop page for a link to the Tomcat Rio book. Really recommend it. As well, there's a lot of other good books there, as we're always talking about. So... You know what else? You know what I did last week? I think I ruined it, Boat. I mentioned to Fish that uh, as I was making a comparison for some of our merchandise, the concert shirts, yeah. and you know what band I used? Van Halen. You know what happened this week? <laughs> yeah, it's very unfortunate. I'm not taking responsibility for this, but uh, yeah, poor Eddie passed on, and he was a real, I don't know about you, I love Van Halen in the 80s, and he was amazing. Any of that big hair, you know, 80s rock music stuff is good in my book, and yeah, it's a shame you start losing all these, not that it doesn't happen every day, but you lose all these big names and, and big pieces of uh, of history uh, in some form or fashion, and this is just the, you know, the, kind of the next one to fall, so yeah, but it is disappointing, but uh, yeah, definitely an unfortunate sense of uh, timing there. Oh, he's only 65 too, but he lived a good life anyway. apparently. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> he certainly looked like it from the outside. Anyway, all right, before we get to AAA, I got a few listener questions and I know your game boat, so let's just jump right into these. I've got an email from Jeremy in Indianapolis who says, I'm wondering what kind of career progression a pilot might have. How long are they at a duty assignment before they get reassigned to another flying or desk assignment? How do they decide who goes where and when? I was also wondering if there was a timeline for promotions and what requirements a pilot has to meet to be considered for promotion. So to that latter point, Jeremy, I think Boat will probably tell you the same thing. It has to do with your performance and reputation. But Boat, I sat on this question deliberately because I thought you could provide the Air Force side of things and then I'll provide the Navy. And I'm guessing they're fairly similar. Yeah, I think they are probably pretty similar because all of this is is in some way, shape or form dictated by what is available funding wise, which is bestowed upon at least the U.S. military by Congress and what they'll allow or authorize in terms of officers since for the U.S. Navy and the uh, U.S. Air Force, that's what you have to be in order to fly. So when it comes down to it, there's only a certain number of uh, pilot positions that are available on any given year at specific ranks. And so that is the first step is how many are available. And then the next is performance. You know, who are the top tier officers and and whatnot based off of what number of uh, spots they have available. And from there, they'll uh, push you forward for promotion or they they won't. And you'll you'll meet the board the, the following year. <laughs> Up or out, they say. That's it. Anyway, Jeremy, to your point, you spent a couple of years in training, of course, for all pilots and aircrew, and your performance there is just relevant to how well you progress and what aircraft you end up selecting or community for that matter. And then once you make it out to the, I guess we'd call it the fleet in the Navy, what do you guys call like the broader, I don't know what you call it in the Air Force boat? It's the CAF, the, the combat air force, basically. Okay. So the fleet or the CAF, then generally speaking, you spend a couple of years in an aviation unit, and then you might spend maybe two or three years doing something else. And that something else could be a staff assignment, uh, like Boat is doing now, but you're a reservist, or it could be at a training command. You could be an admiral or a general's aide. There's all kinds of other things you could do. And we call that a shore tour in the Navy. And then you generally go back to sea, in other words, another flying squadron, and you'll alternate back and forth, but no two careers are ever the same. And so everyone's going to be a little different, whether you go to Top Gun or the training command or 
staff jobs, but you generally go back and forth. And then as Boat mentioned, at some point you get to the point where you're either up or out. And that is you get promoted and you start screening for command or you kind of reach the top and there's the glass ceiling. And then at that point you make your way out. And for some people like me, that is as an 05 or commander. Some people, if they do get a command, will go to 06 and then higher. It just depends on your performance. Yeah, that's pretty much the same on the Air Force side. Usually calf assignments or anything post-training you're going to be at for about three years. And depending on if you're within the uh, continental United States or you're overseas, that may adjust a little bit. But for the most part, it's about a three-year assignment. Every three years, you're on to your next one. And uh, usually you'll hit that first assignment as a flyer. And then the second assignment and beyond is is anybody's guess. That's right. uh, we always kind of joke, needs the Air Force. And that literally is what it is because they may have a different plan for you that you don't want to be a part of, but you're kind of committed there for post uh, training for 10 years at this point is what uh, the Air Force app. I think the Navy is the same way. Yep. And we use a, a community in Millington, Tennessee called the Bupers, and you speak with a detailer, and the detailer is the one who assigns the different things that you'll do, and that's based on his discussion with his counterpart, who is the placement officer, and that person has the jobs available, and then the other guy has the people available, and they do their best to match them. And I'm guessing both the Air Force has something similar, probably call it something different. Yeah, it's just the personnel center in uh San Antonio, Texas, they've got a body that's sitting down there that's assigned to whatever airframe that you're flying, F-16, F-35, all those things. And mm -hmm. they know of those uh, aircraft types and of the pilots available, what positions are available that'll fit the bill. And they plug and play and go from there. So yeah. it's a pretty well, well oiled machine, although it doesn't always feel that way when you're waiting for a, where your next uh, duty assignment is <laughs> going to be. And as I understand it, Jeremy, the more senior you get, the more likely you're going to be grabbed by name for something, especially once you start putting on Admiral or General Stars. Then there's, of course, congressional type boards that have to meet to promote as well. But at that point, they kind of know who is the best uh, suited for certain jobs. And so that's a different story. But anyway, great question. Why don't we move to a phone call? Hi, this is Sean Burrell, U.S. Army veteran. Wanted to know if we could get a P-40 Warhawk and a P-51 Delta Mustang episode. Thank you very much. You guys do a great show. Appreciate everything you do. Thank you. All right, Boat. Well, actually, I'm glad I sat on this one as well because this is right up your alley, isn't it? It is, definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited for uh, what the future holds and obviously uh, Bomber Month being right around the corner and getting my feet wet, if you will, with uh, a couple episodes there. I'm going to try to not branch off by any stretch, uh, but just kind of go back in time a little bit and hopefully find a few warbird pilots or people that are currently flying warbirds that are able to talk about the aircraft and p40 and p51d uh, are uh, definitely right in the wheelhouse there so that's kind of what i'm looking for as we go forward so for all the listeners out there anybody that has any contacts or knows anybody that's smart on those aircraft or anything else really that uh, kind of falls within the world war ii or in that range of time then I'm definitely looking for any contacts you guys have because I can hopefully reach out and, and get some interviews with them and start talking about some older aircraft. I've got a P-38 guy lined up right now that we're working on getting an interview with. Cool. But uh, yeah, it's right there, Jill. I'm looking forward to it. Well, we fly at our airline, you and I, with a gentleman whose dad was a Tuskegee Airman, and he still flies the P-51 Mustang from air show to air show, at least when air shows were a thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not this year. Yeah. But at any rate, yeah, we can uh, help out with that as well. And absolutely, we're hoping Boat will come on and do an occasional Warbird episode in 2021. And I mean, yeah, Boat, if it's going well enough and there's enough of it, maybe we spin you off as your own show. But uh, I don't think there's any reason we necessarily need to kick you out too soon as far as, you know, we'll just maybe one episode a month, we'll just call it Warbird time with you or something. And we'll definitely go back in time and, and cover those aircraft. And as we'll see with Bomber Month, it's getting harder and harder to find the folks who flew it in World War II, but we've got between the museums and flying organizations around the country, I think we have a, a hopefully a lot of opportunity still to grab people who know about these airplanes. Definitely. Yeah. That was one of the reasons if uh, anybody chimed in on Facebook, that was my post there for the World War II Museum down in New Orleans and a lot of great history. And I mean, I spent about four hours and that was not nearly enough time to go through and talk to all the people and, and see all the uh, exhibits they have out there. So definitely go check that out if you have a chance. But yeah, looking forward to, to what we can pull up and, and keep alive from history. Outstanding. All right, Jello. Well, I've got one uh, that I pulled from the email bag. Okay. And this is from Christian from uh, Oslo, Norway. So I'll pose this to you. All right. So we uh, often talk about muscle memory. 
And I can easily relate and agree to that. But there also uh, leads me to a question. In my opinion, stick and rudder skills are perishable. So after a long cruise, how is it to land on a runway? Do you need a couple landings to adjust glide slope, sink rate, and to avoid full throttle upon touchdown? Or what was that experience for you, Dilla? Well, I don't think there's any disputing, Christian, that stick and rudder skills are perishable. I believe every pilot would agree with that. It's really not a big deal, interestingly. The bigger things that you forget are to not lower your hook when you return from, let's say, a six or eight month deployment. You might forget to turn on certain lights. You might forget to turn on your anti-skid, which is always off at the carrier. And so since all those are threats, guess what? We have a brief. Uh, We usually start talking about it the night before, and then the morning of, we have a reminder brief, and whoever's leading it, sometimes a skipper, but maybe a department head who has been tagged with making sure all the aircraft go from ship to shore safely, that they will have points in the flight where they will remind you to check all these different things. And then when you actually get there, of course, you're so excited to see your family after six or eight months that there's a danger there that you will do something out of muscle memory. But for the most part, not too many people have any trouble with this. In fact, I can't think of any on the four or five deployments I've been on where someone came back and and screwed this up. And so it's just one of those things where as a professional pilot, you know what to do and you do it. And are there slips? Sure. It's more often the other way. I've seen aircraft show up at the carrier and they might forget to lower their hook or they might still have certain lights on that you don't want on because the LSOs, when they're looking at you, you don't want lights shining in their face. But it is a threat. We brief it and it's usually not a problem. What do you think, Boat? Does that cover it? (laughs) Yeah. You know, I haven't had one of those types of experience, obviously, but uh, I mean, even on a long pond crossing and whatnot, you're coming up initial to land and you've got to kind of run through a mental checklist there of, okay, I've just been flying. I haven't landed in a while. I need to think about all the the basic steps. So just a lot of things that are perishable or even fleeting, but uh, once you kind of get back in the mindset and start thinking again, uh, they kind of do come back, but it does take a hot second to get back up to speed. And I really liked what Lips said last week. I think I'm going to use that more as I think about what he said and ruminate on it is that in those moments where it was, you know, the game was on, the clock was ticking, whatever you want to call it, yeah. that's when you're really keyed up. And so landings, I think, are always that because those transitionary periods from flight to not flight are always dangerous, takeoffs as well. Definitely. And so in those moments, you're generally not thinking about too much else, which again is a conflict when you're coming home from deployment because you know you're about to see your family, which is a wonderful feeling, but you compartmentalize as we've talked about before on this show. And so you just do what it takes. And again, usually it's not a problem. I don't normally have any issues, at least I didn't, with flying a certain pass. I mean, once you've landed on a carrier for so long, a big, long runway is fairly easy. So you just have to keep yourself in the game and not screw it up, which isn't too hard. So anyway, I think we beat that one to death. Let's take another phone call. Hi, Vincent. Uh, my name is David May. Man, love the podcast. It's such a breath of fresh air. Like I say, I'm definitely in your target audience, someone who wanted to be a military aviator but didn't have the eyes. Hey, I wanted to ask if you had ever uh, considered doing an episode on Commander John Bug Roach, the famous LSO that was, from all accounts, pretty much one of the greatest modern-day fighter pilots and landing signal officers of all time. I would really love to hear an episode on him. He just seemed like such a a unique man. So, all right, thanks. All right, appreciate the phone call. And yes, those of you who follow Naval Aviation, you've probably heard of a gentleman by the name of Commander Roach, call sign Bug, of course. And he was a legend among landing signal officers. I did not know him personally. And I believe he passed away just as I was getting commissioned. He was killed in an A-4 mishap, as I understand. He was such a hit that every year at the Tailhook Annual Convention up in Reno and Sparks, Nevada, which was virtual this year, but the Friday Night Social is named after him. And he was just one of those guys, larger than life, always big smile on his face, as I understand. And so, yeah, if we can find the right person that knows him well enough to be his surrogate on the show, we could certainly have an episode about him and maybe Ellis O's as in a broader context, but I don't know enough to be the expert on that one. And I don't know who does. So maybe those listening, if you know someone who knows Bug Roach or did, uh, or the family or anything about him that can come on and lend an, an ear for it, then we can do that. But as of right now, we don't have the connections that we need. So good question. Appreciate that. But let's finish with an email from 
from Justin. Not sure where Justin's from. This one's a little sticky, perhaps. My question is about nuclear strike. I've read that the B-83 weapon can be carried on just about every fixed-wing aircraft in the Navy and Marine Corps and Air Force inventory. Is that true? And if so, is nuclear strike a mission fighter pilots train for these days? Boat, I'll put it to you first. All right. So, Justin, the, the short answer is yes. At least within the Air Force inventory, all of the aircraft can carry it, I think, minus probably the A-10. I don't think I'd want to do that <laughs> mission in an A-10 as it is. No offense to those guys. But that being said, they do train to it. So specifically, the F-15Es, the Strike Eagles, and the F-16s are the primary uh, carriers of that. I know that there is a future nuclear potential mission there based off of what I've read for the F-35. The F-22, there is not a planned mission for that. But the F-35 is in progress right now in terms of the initial portions of testing and everything, obviously, because as they phase out F-16s, they're going to need additional aircraft you know, capable of executing that mission. All that being said, not every fighter pilot is trained to execute that mission. So only specific units are identified as being nuclear capable, as we like to call it. And so while the aircraft has a switch that's capable of it and the systems in there will be able to support the weapon, they won't necessarily train to it because of the cost and the time and the infrastructure associated with protecting nuclear weapons. And so that's why only specific places have the capability to do it. And that's mostly just due to the infrastructure and cost associated with it. Yep. Boat, I will tell you, uh, 25 years almost in the Navy, 3,800 flight hours, over 3,000 the F-18. When I read Justin's email, I said B-83. I guess I'm supposed to know what that is. <laughs> Truthfully, we never did anything with it. I remember asking as a young officer about the nuclear enable switch in the F-18 off on the pilot's left side, and they said, it doesn't work. And honestly, that was it. We never did anything with it. There wasn't any hush-hush stuff or people going, at least that I was ever aware of, behind closed doors to talk about it. I don't know that it's on carriers anymore. I'm quite sure it's not, frankly. And at least in the F-18 community, we didn't do anything with it. Never heard any Marines talk about it. Don't remember F-14 guys talking about it. So I think it's gone from the carrier. But again, maybe I just wasn't on the inner circle. I don't know. Yeah, I'd add there to it. I don't think the Navy is the primary nuclear option other than submarines. I think it definitely is the Air Force. Right. But kind of to your point, there is a switch in an F-16 and it is ready to be activated if they're going to put those things on there. But uh, if you're not in a, in a nuclear capable squad and that thing is hardwired off right. and you're not touching it. So it's all there, but in terms of training and, and whatnot, I couldn't speak directly to it, but I definitely appreciate the fact that I didn't have to be qualified in a nuclear mission because that's just a <laughs> whole nother level of pain that you have to go through on a consistent basis. Well, I mean, just thinking back to our A4, 5, 6, and 7, right, episodes on this yeah. show, we had people talk about they had to do their PSYOP plan, and each one had their own target, and they had to brief it and do all these different exercises and missions and stuff, and training missions, of course. And so, yeah, it just sounds like a giant pain, and I'm glad, frankly, it's not something we have to do. So, oh, yeah. Good question, Justin. All right, that'll do it for questions for this week. We've got a few more we'll save for probably next week, and then we'll, of course, uh, skip those, generally speaking, for Bomber Month. All right, Boat, we've got the uh, AAA interview coming up with Crunch. You had a chance to preview it. Any thoughts before we get to it? I have, yeah. Other than um, it being kind of a small quantity segment of one of the things that we deal with as fighter pilots, I thought you guys did a good job of kind of getting your way through all the different odds and ends within AAA. <laughs> Obviously for this episode, we're trying to focus specifically on the artillery side or the projectile gun, if you want to call it that side of the, the house. And there was a lot of different avenues of things to discuss, but I thought you guys did a great job. Pretty fun interview, frankly. Yeah, well, and I think because it's fairly straightforward, we kind of end up all over the map as you'll hear in just a moment. So anyway, let's get to AAA with Craig Snyder. All right, dialing in today from Norfolk, Virginia, is retired United States Navy Captain Craig Snyder. He's a former F-14 pilot, Top Gun instructor, all-around great dude. What's going on, Crunch? Oh, not much, Jello. How are you? It's great to be here. <laughs> Thanks for the invite. Yeah. Calling in from beautiful Norfolk, Virginia, the, the sunny afternoon. Having a great day. <laughs> well, the other thing I didn't announce in that little uh, intro is that you and I were Top Gun students together. That's right. We went through the class. Uh, I believe it was class 0300. That's right. In March of 2000, we went yep. through the class. And you went through with uh, Pete Notes, Ike, as I recall, in an F-14? 
That's right. We went through as uh, Top Gun 3 was our call sign. Okay. I was Top Gun 7. Yeah. That's, that's right. right. And then we stuck around. We were uh, on the staff together in the squad and there together as instructors for the next three years. Yes, we did. And as if I recall correctly, you were the, let's see if I can get this right, surface to air threat and counter tactics, me? That's right. I was also the air to air shot validation expert for uh, both Tomcat oh. and the Hornet. That was where I started. That's right. And uh, then I did the surface to air threats, surface to air counter tactics. As a matter of fact, I even uh, would lecture, discuss with not only the blue pilots going through, the students going through as on the blue side, mm -hmm. but also the adversary students. I would teach them separately. I would also teach the helicopter weapon school students, as well as the, there was a S3 weapon school that started up later. That's right. As well as the air wing. So every time an air wing would come through, which was like <laughs> five, six, seven times a year, I'd lecture to the entire air wing and go over recent history, current events, tactics, things like that. It's great stuff. You were and are the man, Crunch. And so <laughs> let's talk about all that stuff, but let's back up a little bit. Where are you from? Yeah. What did you do prior to that? What did you do after that in the Navy? And what are you doing now? So what do I do now? Well, okay, so back up. I uh, grew up in Western New York, went down, graduated high school down by New York City, went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 93, went straight off to flight school, went through uh, Pensacola, then Whiting Field, then uh, NAS Meridian, got winged there flying the T-2 and the A-4, went off to Naval Air Station Oceana and learned to fly the F-14, start off with the F-14A, then the B, and then off to Top Gun, and then flying the F-14D for a bunch and a whole bunch of stuff after that. Let's see, that include what I do after that. So after that, I was uh, spent some time at the Pentagon. I was a squadron commanding officer down in Meridian for VT-9. I was the air boss in the Eisenhower. So I was in charge of the, uh, you know, the guy in the tower with the yellow jersey drinking the coffee cup. Uh, I was in charge of, you know, the flight deck, the hangar deck, the catapults, resting gear, the aviation mm -hmm. fuel systems, and all the operations all up to five miles, up to 2,500 feet during the daytime. So good stuff there. Then I was a uh, base CO for Diego Garcia, a little island, part of the British Indian Ocean Territories. We got a facility out there in the middle of the ocean. My boss was about 5,000 miles away in Japan. Uh, what a great time that was. Then I did some stuff after that. I was on a staff at Fleet Forces, the old Atlantic Fleet. I was basically a consultant to the Royal Navy and the Royal Air Force. Basically brought on board the F-35B uh, for the maiden deployments on board HMS Queen Elizabeth and HMS Prince of Wales. I then got out and actually then went to American Airlines. I'm now a first officer on the Airbus based in Washington, D.C. for American Airlines. And uh, that's about where I am now. Awesome. Yeah, that sounds good, man. And uh, we're on opposite coasts, but our paths have crossed a few times. Yeah, that's right. So, Crunch, with your expertise, here's what I'm thinking, dude, although I don't know how this will play out, but by the time everyone hears it, we'll have a good plan. But you were, as we said earlier, the surface-to-air threat and counter tactics. We'll bring you back some other time for the shot valve stuff. Oh, yeah. But I'm thinking like a two-part series here we can talk about, maybe AAA and some stuff today. And then maybe we'll get Jethro to come over and talk about Sam, since I think he had one shot at him. And we'll have you like be our guest co-host for that one. How's that sound? Oh, I love it. That sounds great. Excellent. So... Do I remember correctly, did you used to lecture that in the hundred years of military aviation or aviation in general, AAA is what has brought down more aircraft than anything else, whether SAMs or other aircraft or anything like that? I recall something like that, saying that that was like the percentage threat. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't remember the numbers on it or the details other than saying that, hey, this is a bigger threat than we give it credit for. Yeah. Well, it's not that hard to pick up a gun and shoot at an airplane going by, and then also they have bigger guns, and yeah. we'll get into that. Let's take this approach. When you used to give your lecture, what parts did you give, if you recall? In other words, I'm guessing you did some theory. That's right. What did that do? So there were two lectures. There was a surface air threats, and then there were surface air counter tactics. And the surface air threats, I would talk about uh, theory concepts, the different types of radar theory, barrage, AAA, you know, aimed fire, lead lag, pursuit curves, things like that. And then we talked about all the different threat systems mm -hmm. and where they were, kind of the, how many they had and some of their capabilities. That was all the number stuff. Pretty dry, to be honest. And we would go through the big old things like SA2s and 3s up to the new sexy SA11s, SA15s. And then we do man pads, a whole section on man pads. We go mm -hmm. SA74 up to 18 and so on. And then we did a section on AAA, which was actually only 15 to 20 minutes long, as I recall, because it was kind of like, hey, there's a bunch of big guns and they can be aimed or not. You know, it's basically <laughs> the takeaway. Yeah. 
And then I gave another lecture that was usually like the next day or next week, if I recall, was surf to air counter tactics. And that one, we would talk again, some more theory, lead like pursuit, things like that. But then we would go into the kinematics of a missile and how you could go about defeating a missile, whether it's through the defeating the host radar or the radar or receiver system on board the missile, or we could defeat the flight of the missile through kinematic means, meaning Mm -hmm. we would maneuver our aircraft in such a way that the missile would run out of it run out of juice because, you know, it only has so much energy that, you know, the rocket actually on the back of that missile was eventually going to run out. And now it's just coasting and decelerating the whole time. And if you can make it change direction enough times, it runs out of slits and uh, it can't hit you. Okay. On the second half of that, counter tactics are always something we need to be careful on here on the show because that's the things we do and that's always protected with classification levels. So let's talk a little bit about AAA in general and then a little bit about countermeasures. But again, we'll have to be vague. Let's start with big picture stuff here, Crunch. What is AAA and and even tell us what the acronym stands for? Sure, absolutely. So AAA, anti-aircraft artillery. All that means is there's somebody down on the ground with a gun and they're trying to shoot it into the air and hit an airplane. So it doesn't matter what kind of gun it is. It can be anything from a pistol all the way up to a heavy surface-to-air ground fire with, or a ZSU-23 TAC-4, which is shooting you know, basically a machine gun surface-to-air fire. I mean, there's so many different types of AAA fire out there. And that's why it's such a threat, right? Because, again, thinking back to the flight of the intruder story is some fellow on the ground picks up his rifle in Vietnam at night, shoots blindly, and it kills the BN of the A6. And of course, that's a fictional story, but it's very plausible. It is very plausible. And I got a couple of stories on AAA I'll share with you. So I remember talking with one of my old skippers. We were talking one time, and he used to be flying A6s. And uh, he was talking about flying in the Gulf War 91. And he was on the, the low carrier. I think it was the Saratoga. I don't remember. Whichever it was, the one that was going in low. And uh, so he's flying A6s, and he told the story about flying in. They're shoot, flying in at like, you know, 100 feet or something like that, whatever it was they were doing, I don't know. And he's flying around, looks over, there's his wingman. He looks back forward. They're getting shot at, good shot at, looks over to the right, and his wingman's gone, right? Just shot out of the sky, never even saw it because AAA happened. You know, who knows what took that guy down, but, you know, he got shot down right there. Wow. So that's how I was told the story. Ed. Now, I don't know a lot of details, uh, and I certainly don't want to get anything wrong. So I'll just say that I know that it's happened. Here's another mm-hmm. one for you. This one happened to my dad. So back in, this would be back in the 1970s. So my dad flew Hueys in Vietnam, right? He flew, was in the Army, flew Hueys in Vietnam. He comes back, and he's flying for the National Guard out of Niagara Falls up in New York, right? So we're flying outside of Buffalo, and he's flying a mission one night he's coming back into the airport at niagara falls in his huey and they're coming in and they turn all the landing lights on it just as they're going you know approaching the airfield well apparently they unbeknownst to them were flying over an ongoing drug deal or something <laughs> to that effect they don't know what it was exactly all they know is that somebody down there saw all their lights come on and just unloads on them with a machine gun fire this is now in <laughs> What, outside of Buffalo, New York in the 70s, that there is no reason for them to be getting shot at. All of a sudden, he's getting, he, no kidding, one of the bullets goes up, goes through the rudder pedal that his foot is on, barely misses his foot, and starts banging around on the inside of the cockpit. Surprisingly, none of them got hit. Nobody got hurt. They were able to land the airplane. But it's like, holy cow, you know, AAA happens. <laughs> even in Western New York in the 70s and the peace out. I so, guess. Yeah. Crazy. Well, and it's been happening long before that. Again, as long as there's been firearms, which was well before aircraft, someone thought, all right, let's pick these up and uh, shoot at these guys. But yeah. there's a lot of different terminology, right? It's different ways to describe it, if you will. And, not, and I don't mean the calibers. I mean, like we have what? AAA, we have flak. Yeah. So yeah, that's a great point. So flak the way I understand it is that's when, like, you have an airburst, right? So you take, like, think World War II is they're flying the B-17s into Germany. They're mm-hmm. shooting from the ground. The warhead goes up in the air and boom, it explodes in the air and creates a whole bunch of shrapnel up there. Uh, that's what I've always thought of flak ass. Uh, okay. But that's barrage fire. They're just putting up a big, giant cloud of junk, and you got to fly through it. And odds are pretty good that you're going you're gonna to take some damage going through there, whether it's an, yeah. an engine or a wing, flight control, who knows? 
Mm -hmm. I've heard it called ack ack, I guess, as well, which is probably just for AA. But so to your point, I think it was your lecture where I finally realized this was the case. If you and I go out dove hunting, let's say, and you're shooting a shotgun and I'm using a rifle, which you're going to obviously do better, and that's not the point I'm trying to make, but our projectiles go up and then if they miss the target, they just keep going. AAA is not always like that. They're actually little exploding projectiles. Frequently, yes, you're absolutely right, because they're going to have little, you know, whether uh, I believe they're like little, uh, you can set it based on the pressure altitude. So it's a little barometer in there. And when the pressure changes to that altitude, boom, that's where it goes off. I suppose it could just be a timer. Mm -hmm. That's something I'm a little light on the knowledge there, but I don't know if it's a timer, but I believe it's just based off of the altitude. So you say, hey, I want it to go off at 15,000 feet. You dial in 15 and up it goes. That's the way I understand it. Yeah. Well, I bet both would work because if you know a little bit about physics with the projectile and the environmentals, hey, if I fire it at this angle, it's going to go to this spot. And then after so much time, it'll be at this altitude. So, of course, it's on a projectile path, but you can do it that way. Yeah. And I guess this is why it's so important to not let the enemy know what altitude you're at. So if there are contrails and they know the contrails begin at a certain altitude, well, that lets them know your altitude. And so they can dial in accordingly. Or if there's an overcast, right? So if you're right below an overcast and they know the overcast is a certain altitude, then that helps them dial it in. And like you said, I've read, I can't remember where, but anecdotally, you know, they would say in World War II, it was so thick, you felt like you could get out and walk on it. And so... (laughs) That sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I agree. I agree. So I was on the first strike of, you remember in ni- December of 98, Operation Desert Fox. So Operation Desert Fox. Desert Fox. Yeah. I was on the, uh, well, gee whiz, which carrier was that? The Enterprise, I think. So we were on the Enterprise and we were sitting there in the Gulf and that was the whole Saddam Hussein kicked out the weapons inspectors and we said, hey, we're coming at midnight. Dang it. And sure enough, that's right. Boom, off we went. And so I was actually, uh, it was me and uh, Jim McCall, call sign Mouth, were... Yeah, I remember Mouth. Yeah, so Mouth and I were on Cat 1, and we were the first jet off the flight deck for Operation Desert Fox. Bang, we bang off the front. Weren't you a Nugget? I was on my second cruise. Okay. I can't remember if I was a division lead or not, but I think I was either Dash 3 or Dash 4 that day. I might not have been a flight lead yet. Uh-huh. I think it was just sexually. I don't remember, but I was either dash three or dash four, but I was the first one off the flight deck and I was part of the second division. So a division is four airplanes. So there was a four airplanes in front of us and then us. And I was either number three or four in there somewhere. I don't remember, but we went in with GBU 24s and we were going to bomb some stuff. But as we were going in, we had night vision goggles on because uh, that was new to the fleet. Those old cat size, really heavy, mm-hmm. not great, but good enough. And we're flying in, and as we're coming up the highway, we're going over Kuwait and up by Basra, coming feet dry, going up to north towards uh, towards our target, which was going to be somewhere between Basra and Baghdad. And I can't remember exactly what area we were going for, but we go in there, and you know, as you're looking up, you're just seeing all this AAA in the distance, and it was on the goggles. You could see it just getting shot into the air in front of you. And I don't know how far away it was, but... It's in the distance. You could see it in your goggles, and it was coming up to your altitude. Hmm. It was just like the TV when you would see it on CNN. You see all the fire going up. Uh-huh. You could see that in your goggles. And it was one of those things where uh, it was like, wow, that's, uh, let's not go over there because that looks like that could hurt. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we went and did our mission came out. Yeah, the only time I ever experienced it was uh, we were supposed to take a look. I think it was right after that. I was there in 99 mm-hmm. for my second cruise, and we were looking at a AAA site. And there's these little puffs going off on the FLIR, and I was still new and dumb. And I thought, mm-hmm. hey, good spots. Because what I was used to at that point was someone dropping like Mark 76s or LGTRs. Mm-hmm. And so I see these little puffs that to me look like someone's plinking Mark 76s. And I say, hey, good spot. And the XO of the other squadron, who was our lead, he's like, hey, they're shooting at us. I'm like, oh. <laughs> Oops. All right. But it was daytime. So I was like, well, I don't see anything. So I must be fine. And um, <laughs> we turned around and dropped the bomb on them and yeah. probably spent more on the bomb than they did on their gun. But yeah, anyway, right. getting to that. So there's different classifications, right? So like you said, you have a pistol, you got a rifle. I mean, you're up to maybe seven, six, two type of size or five, five, six, two, two, three, kind of leave. There's so many different ways, but yeah, you also said anti-aircraft artillery. Yeah. And right. so these things get very big. What are the different classifications, as I recall. 
what I mean is, as I recall, you lecturing in groups, right? Like, well, it's funny. I'm sitting there going, crap, he's asking me the size. And I, hey, think I told I was, you we're going to have this interview, man. Come on. No, I know. <laughs> and I'm sitting there going, you know what? This is something where I would thought about it. And I was like, I forgot to look this up because I used to know this stuff like the back of my hand. But it has been 20 years, by the way, since we went through the class. Isn't that sorry, dude? <laughs> I know. But I bet you're still as thin as you used to be. Uh, I'm trying. I don't know. I yeah. just turned 50 a couple weeks ago. So, uh, Well, congratulations. Happy birthday. Thanks. You know, going back, I don't know if you remember, you and I actually were in VT7 together too, if I remember right. Yeah. I think you were probably, you know, three, four months ahead of me. I secured in the summer of 95 and got winged like in August. Ah, okay. I was uh, September 12th and September 14th was my CQ and I got winged okay. after uh, the October 1 fiscal year. I think it was like October 7th or something. Okay, like cool. Are you just bringing this up while you Google the different sizes of... uh... I am, but I figured you could use that. (laughs) Well, as I recall, let's see, I'm going to take a stab at this. There was light, medium, wasn't it just like light, medium, and heavy, and then small arms, something like that? Yeah, I think so. And it was just caliber, right? So small arms was anything a man can carry, and then you had like... 20 to 30 and 30 to 50 and above 50 was heavy. And, but long story short, we think of artillery as like a 105 millimeter howitzer that either the army shoots or yeah. AC one thirty buddy buck, who's been on the show shoots out the side of the, what do they call those things? Gun ships, uh, spookies, all that, but they can shoot projectiles that large up as well. As I recall. That's right. Well, here's one. I'm just, uh, you know, recall thinking off the, uh, off the top of my head here is there was one called the S60, which was from the old Soviet Union. It was, mm-hmm. I think it was from the 60s or 50s, somewhere around there. That one was a 57 millimeter round, as I recall. So 57 millimeter. Yeah. And that's big. You know, you think about it, what's six centimeters? 57 millimeters, that's 5.7 centimeters. What is that, like three inches? That's big. Yeah. I know that. It's pretty big. You think about it, that's <laughs> pretty big around coming up at you. You know, that was one of the bigger ones, but they were everywhere. They were in a lot of different places. Now, there are different sizes. There was 57 millimeter. There was 37 millimeter rounds, as I recall. And then you got things like the ZSU-23 TAC-4. Now, the ZSU-23 TAC-4 was a ground-based, essentially, machine gun. It had four barrels, and it was a you know a track vehicle. Look, kind of looks like a tank. Track vehicle with its own little radar on top, and then four you know, rifle barrels sticking out and those things fired each in order. So basically imagine how fast you can shoot when instead of shooting one at a time machine gun, you got stinging four of them going at once, mm-hmm. right? I'm not a hundred percent on how fast that thing would be able to shoot. Well, fast enough to be a threat to a helicopter or even a strike fighter. Yeah. And if I remember right, I think it was like a 14 millimeter round. Wouldn't it be a 23 millimeter round? Or 23 ZSU? millimeter. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> so ZSU 23 TAC 4, the 23 millimeter round. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so the ZSU 23 TAC 4, you know, 23 millimeter round, this thing was pretty impressive. It shot down a lot of airplanes back in Vietnam, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, I can't remember when it came out, but I do remember for a time it was a predominant threat for us, particularly if we came in at low altitude. That's right. And I guess that's really the point of this whole thing is, okay, we'll just come in at higher altitude because these guns are relatively cheap. They're widely proliferated. They're easy to operate. And so anytime you go low, you have this risk. You can go high, but of course, then you have other challenges, whether it's surface air missiles that's right. or target acquisition, weather, et cetera. Well, that's a great point. You, well, you tie all this together into like a, an integrated air defense system where you have AAA for your lower altitude targets. So imagine that you're coming in on a high altitude strike, uh, a strike meaning I launch off the ship, I go across the water, I go feet dry, I'm now going in country, and I want to go hit a pre-planned target that would be a strike. So as I'm going in, I might be up 30,000 feet or higher as I head in because I know that I am safe from that AAA fire for the most part. Well, way up there, there's missiles coming at you. So maybe they shoot up some old SA-2s and SA-3s at you that they're relatively easy to defeat. But as you do that, you start bleeding energy. You're no longer in the 30s. You're now down in the Mm mid-20s. You're down in the mid-20s, and now they start shooting other things at you. Maybe they shoot an SA-6 at you, which is a lot harder to defeat. And once you defeat that, now you're down in the low altitude. Maybe you're at 10, 15,000 feet. You're off your parameters. Maybe you can't even solve your weapons delivery solution for your target anymore, but you're beat down. And now you're trying to either go in or back out. And now you're you're stuck. And there's a mountain peak. So you go down the valley. Well, down in the valley, there's some other defenses. Maybe they've strung some wires across the valley. Maybe there's some 
tethered balloons in the way, or there's just a couple of ZSU 23-4s sitting there ready to just hose off some golden BBs at you and just shoot you down. And mm-hmm. it could go bad really quick. So as a part of an entire integrated air defense, AAA has a huge role, especially if they can beat you down into that low altitude environment where it is incredibly deadly. Yeah. Sometimes they wouldn't even necessarily guide the missile. They would just fire it in your general direction because if they get you to react, they've already won that first step. What a great point. Yeah. So, a Z, you know, an SA-2, an old Soviet SA-2 from the 1950s, it was a flying telephone pole. Mm-hmm. It had a few few moves in it. And then after that, it was out of energy. But you had to spend some energy to make it to make those movements. Yeah. And so now they shoot one at you. It looks like it's close. You got to honor it a little bit. Oh. I defeated that one. I come back on. Now they shoot another one. Oh, got to honor that one. But next thing you know, you're off your parameters. And I mean, they don't even have to shoot you down as long as you don't succeed at your mission. They kind of won, right? That's a mission success. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the overarching theme here is that we are assuming that we see these missiles. The one that you don't see, Mm. just like the MiG that you're six that you don't see, is Mm. the one that's going to uh, be the biggest problem. (laughs) So let's talk about that for a second. So well, we're talking about AAA here right now. We're not talking about missiles. But with <laughs> missiles, a lot of times, the one coming straight at you is the hardest to see. That's the one that's going to hit you. That's the one that's the hardest to see because that smoke trail is just right behind that dot that's coming at you. Mm-hmm. Whereas the one that you can see the line of the missile and then the line of smoke behind it, well, that's off in the distance and that's tracking somebody else. Kind of look, might look like a space shuttle launch coming off of Cape Kennedy. You know, you could see that. But if it was coming straight for you, you can imagine it'd be harder to see. Yeah. In AAA, there's no smoke trail. It's just little puffs from the rifle barrel as it's shooting at you. And you're just going to suddenly start feeling it. That's all. Yeah. Unless there's tracers. That's what I was about to say. You might get the tracers, yeah. in which case you might be inclined to think, oh, there's not that many, but the tracer is one every so many, right? That's right. Yeah. I don't know what the TTP is on that, whether it's one every five or one every 10. I don't know. However the gunner's loaded, I guess. Right. I think it's up to them. And we're all out of normal rounds. We're just going to put tracers in. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. What are the different types of fire, Crunch? So you got aimed fire. You got barrage fire. I'm in the F-18. You're on the ground. And so I go flying by and you think you can hit me. So again, mm-hmm. like our dove hunting experience, you're going to aim at the dove and take a shot. So if I fly by, you can aim at me. What if you just kind of know I'm going by and you just want to shoot in where you think I'm going to be? Is that the barrage? Yeah, that's uh, that barrage fire or uh, do they call it curtain fire. Is that right? Am I making that up? I think they did, didn't they? No, that's right. Curtain fire is a barrage fire different from rapid continuous artillery or machine gun fire in a designated line or area. Okay. Game back on. All right. So, <laughs> so yeah. So let's say, you know, if you're going by, just like your dove hunting analogy, and I want to take a shot at you, you know, I figure out what your line is. I put a lead in there and, you know, keep the gun tracking, pull the trigger, boom, maybe I get that one shot. On the other hand, I could shoot, say, hey, they're flying through this area. I know they're going to have to pass above me. Maybe I just take all my guns, train them pretty much straight up, and just keep shooting. And I create almost like a wall of lead as it's going up. Mm -hmm. That would be curtain fire. And you're just going to fly right through that, and there's a chance that you might hit something. And then you got barrage fire. So they say, hey, you're going to be going through this area. And that's, think, World War II B-17s over Germany. You know, they're going to be shooting up all this airborne explode (laughs) artillery that's going up, and it's just uh, exploding all around you and creating a big, giant cloud. And they're just, uh, you know, kind of shooting in your general area, but not trying to hit you specifically. Well, I would debate that point. I mean, obviously they're trying to hit you, but I guess it's not quite as aimed as the the dove that you've yeah. taken a bead on. Yeah, I guess in the terms of I'm thinking of it differently. <laughs> you're absolutely right. They are trying to yeah. hit you. What I mean yeah. is like in aimed fire, you might have a radar supporting your gun. Ah, right. Gotcha. So the radar is tracking and that the radar, there's a, a computer that is developing a firing solution mm-hmm. and it's telling the system where to aim that gun and it's shooting the rounds out in front and it's trying to put every single one into you. Yeah. Whereas the curtain fire unaimed it's just putting up a wall and the barrage fire i imagine it's still controlled by a computer in most cases but it's saying hey i'm probably not going to hit you specifically let me put some behind you in front of you above you below you to your left and your right kind of like when they're doing you know surface to surface artillery fire you know they shoot that first round down range boom and they just start doing drop 50 left 50 boom boom hey that's close enough fire for effect yeah. and now they just shoot them all down range well they don't shoot all 10 of those next rounds all to that exact same spot they actually put in a a dispersion maybe a dispersion Slightly. great well what a much better word that is so they're putting some <laughs> dispersion characteristic where you know it goes left right forward and back so that you get bigger better effects so that's yeah. kind of barrage fire 
I wonder if Barrage Fire is a little bit like the end of the game, Hail Mary. I'm just going to throw this down there and maybe someone mm. will grab it versus the play where the guy breaks free from his defender and now you've got the precise pass to him. That's more like the aimed fire. So I yeah. don't know if that quite works, but anyway. It's one way to think of it. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Sure. So that said, and again, with the sensitivities of not giving away anything too much, what are some ways that we can get away from this? Obviously, we talked about one, which is, well, first, just don't fly there. But I mean, if you have to fly there, what other options do we have? Well, it's funny. You started to say that. The first one uh, I came up with, I was ready to just shout it was, don't be there. (laughs) That's (laughs) that's what you want to (laughs) do. Avoid, avoid. So what do you do first? You can go in high. If you're going at high altitude, most AAA can't reach you. Mm -hmm. So you can go in high and and that's pretty much going to be it. But like we said, integrated air defense, maybe they start beating you down into that region where you are more susceptible. So that's certainly something that may not be always be available. Okay. On the other hand, let's say that you're going to a target that is not in this big giant city, but your target's on the other side of the city. Well, you can imagine that the city is probably going to have some air defenses around it, whereas the surrounding countryside will have a lot less. Well, maybe you would go around the city with your flight plan, your path for your strike, so that you didn't put yourself in a scenario where you were going to fly through an area where they were likely to have a lot of uh, air defenses. So that would be one way. So you could go high above or you could go laterally around it. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if you find yourself in like a barrage fire scenario where it's starting to blow up all around you, the best thing you can do is go as fast as you can, a straight line and get out of there, right? You just got to get through it. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if they're aiming at you, the last thing you want to do is stay predictable. You actually need to start moving your airplane and be unpredictable. Yeah. So what's the difference? In the barrage fire, it's a big giant area. If you start flying in an unpredictable manner, all you've done is slow your downrange travel and extended the period of time that you're susceptible to that barrage fire. Hmm. On the other hand, if it's aimed fire, they're aiming it and they're trying to put every one of those into you. If you just keep going straight, obviously the fire control solution is going to be accurate and it's going to hit you. So you need to start making changes to your flight path vector because once a round leaves the barrel of a gun, it can no longer be adjusted in flight unless it has fins or little rockets or something like that. But 99.9% of rounds that I'm aware of uh, have no guidance once they leave the barrel, right? So once it leaves the barrel, if it has a fire control solution that says, hey, go this many degrees to the right, this many up, and now, boom, and it shoots, well, you're going to get hit. Well, all you got to do is put in a little bit of a flight path vector change, and you're no longer in that spot in 17 seconds when it calculates that you're going to be there. Mm -hmm. So all you got to do is not be at that spot. So that's kind of the difference of how you might defeat those two things. Well, and getting back to our dove hunting analogy, I've expended a lot of rounds on certain doves before that have been chucking and jiving. And Mm. as they fly away, I always salute them uh, one way or the other. (laughs) But, you know, the ones that are really like, if they're just going long, they don't know there's a threat. It's pretty relatively easy. But the ones that are really going around, have you ever dove hunted? It's a lot of fun, actually. Believe it or not, I have not. I have never gone dove hunting. All right. Well, we'll have to uh, rectify that sometime. But let's do that. I love that. It's idea. not easy. Of course, we'll have to go somewhere other than California because you have to have special ammo here now. It's a big pain. The... Anyway, so well, what happens to all these rounds, Crunch, after they go up? I once read that during Pearl Harbor, the attack in 1941, that a lot of the damage done in Honolulu was from the gunners in Pearl Harbor. Oh, I had not heard that. I don't doubt it for a second, though, because I tell you, every single one of those that goes up is coming back down somewhere. It's just a matter of where. Mm-hmm. They're big old rounds. I mean, you imagine that, you know, 23 millimeter, you know, ZSU 23 TAC 4, that 23 millimeter round is coming down somewhere. And it's going to create some damage. Now, the ones that explode, of course, all the little shrapnel is coming down and it's not going to have quite as much velocity because sure. it's some smaller pieces. But yeah, I don't remember where I read that, but I do remember reading something about that. So collateral damage for those guys must be a concern. Yeah. What about our own, uh, and I'm going to put you on the spot here, Does like I'm not aware per se of AAA in the American military, but is it something we also have? Maybe it's something the Army has. I know we've got the phalanx stuff on the ships. but Yeah, we got the phalanx on the ship. That's more for or, uh, you know, inbound missiles uh, certainly could be used for airplanes. Absolutely. But, you know, it certainly was designed for like to counter things like exosane missiles and mm-hmm. things like that. But uh, we do have AAA. We do have surface to air weapons. And you're going to ask me what they are. And I'm going to say, I don't know, because I was always thinking about the threats and not our own. But I know we got stuff because, I mean, we even have uh, 
surface air missile, you know, what are they called? Lad battery. I think in the Marines call them counter air batteries, maybe or something. Counter so. air batteries. I'll take your word for it. We have all those things. We have, yeah. you know, in our surface air missiles, we, we call them Patriots or SM2s. You know, we have all the same things. It's just that uh, I'm not as well versed on our blue systems because that's never something I've ever actually studied. I wasn't worried about getting <laughs> shot by, down by those, really. Well, unfortunately, it does happen. I think we lost a Hornet to a Patriot. No, that's the beauty of recording this early. And then later I can make a note to myself and we can fill it in before or after in the interview. But yeah, we can always do another follow up to say, hey, don't forget this. Let's do this question again. Well, that was the plan. Remember, you're going to come back and help us with Sam's here on part two. So yeah, absolutely. All right. What about uh, you kind of alluded to it? And again, to your point, it may be using my football analogy. Once the quarterback releases the ball, it's going to go where physics dictates. And so it's a projectile at that point. And, and so is most AAA. But right. do you happen to know if you remember, it's, again, it's, I know it's been a long time, but advancements, developments in the AAA world, I'm guessing it doesn't get a lot of money and technology put at it because it's relatively not very sexy, I guess, but it's very effective. So what do you know about what's coming down? Here's what I do know is I remember one of the things I used to lecture was don't expect much in the way of advancements because it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it's the fire control radar that has seen the advancements. That's where you were seeing a lot of that advancements. Yeah. Now, what are we seeing coming up in the future? Well, you got things like rail guns where they're shooting off these big, heavy projectiles that don't even have warheads because they're just you know hitting with so much kinetic energy that it doesn't even need a warhead. What's coming up in the future with AAA? I don't really know because I'm not dialed in anymore. Like I said, I'm an airline pilot. I'm more concerned about the <laughs> making the connection in Charlotte. <laughs> You're leading the Kush life now, huh? Yeah, that's right. right. Excuse, excuse me, I'll take uh, just a black coffee, please. It's a simple, effective system to shoot something that's widely proliferated yeah. at aircraft that are trying to do you harm. Yeah. And if you miss, it's no big deal, although it can be in certain circumstances. Yeah. Uh, but it's cheap, it's effective, and it can uh, really wreak havoc on the air crew and the aircraft. It's probably going to be around for a long time. Like you said, developments in the radar and acquisition and guidance, probably the rate of fire, I would think as well for some. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, in the end, it's just one more way to try to take out an air threat. Yeah. And it kind of related, but a little bit different. There's a couple of newer threats out there that haven't been around that long. And they're very similar. And the first one is lasers, right? You know, sometimes people just pick up a laser pointer and they start shining it at the airplane. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. If it's a strong enough laser, you could actually cause eye damage to the pilots. Well, holy cow, what a, a, an interesting way that you could, instead of shooting a gun, maybe you shoot a laser at an airplane. And yeah. does that do the damage? I'm not talking about a laser that's going to like heat up the side and blow it up like something out of Star Wars or Star Trek. I mean, just something where it might either temporarily or permanently damage your vision as a pilot. Now you can't perform anymore. Well, I believe that's not to say anyone cares, but I believe that's prohibited by Geneva Convention. But at any rate, well, there's a lot of stuff that's prohibited. You know, it's also against a lot of speed, but, yeah. you know, <laughs> I don't speed crunch. Oh, well, all right. Well, <laughs> I was doing 56 on the highway. today, So I, am, you. yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, what was the next thing you were going to say? The next one I was going to say similar, but different are drones. So you think about, you've probably seen videos on YouTube of, People just having a drone up there, and they're flying this drone right along final at an airport. Here comes this airliner zoom, zipping right past the drone. Mm -hmm. Well, imagine if you're a bad guy and you want to take that drone. You know, you don't even have to put a weapon on it if you're able to fly that thing down an engine of a flying yeah. airplane. If you're low enough and that drone can get high enough, it's almost like guided AAA sort of. I mean, not really. It's different, it but it's still a threat. From the ground, it's not a missile. Right. It's not really AAA, but it's something that could cause damage to an airplane, for sure. Well, what if you could control a whole bunch of them in a swarm and put them out almost like the, what were those barrage balloons or whatever you see on like yeah. D-Day on the beaches? That's Wasn't right. that the same idea as to keep aircraft from flying down and strafing guys? So Yeah, imagine. Imagine if you, that's a great point. Imagine if you just put up a thousand drones in a wall, kind of like curtain fire, yeah. but now you got a, a wall of drones. Good luck. You couldn't miss. Yeah, that's right. You're going to fly right through them and you're going to take damage. Wow. And maybe it's enough to take you down or maybe it's an, it's not, but you're probably going to fly around it if you can. And that's going to throw you <laughs> off your, your numbers. Yeah, that's just my well, thoughts. Crunch, you're a, you're a character, yeah. buddy. You haven't changed a bit. <laughs> but uh, hey, so just to uh, wrap up then, tell me about the rest of that night on Desert Fox. You saw a bunch of AAA. By the time you got there, did it stop? Did you guys squelch it? Did you go over it? Uh, was it not an issue? What happened? As we were going in, I remember the AAA was all... And like Baghdad. And so as we're going downrange, 
our course over the ground didn't take us all the way to where all the AAA was. We didn't know that at the time, mm -hmm. but looking back, it was all that AAA was up there protecting the routes into Baghdad. Yeah. Remember, this was, uh, what was the date? I don't remember, December 28th, 1998, if I'm not mistaken. I do know it was 98 because I deployed in December of 97 and 99. And of course, you yeah. suckers are out there doing it while we're sitting at home doing nothing. So. Right, right. Well, <laughs> I'm always missing the party. You know, I'm always dressed up, but missing the party. Yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. There's a whole bunch of stuff that I missed, too. <laughs> Just not that one. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. So 24 years of service, how many flight hours did you end up with? And you went on to fly the Hornet and a bunch of other stuff, right? Yeah. So I flew, uh, I started off the, I flew the F-14A, the F-14B, the F-14D, and then the F-18, A, B, C, D, E, and F. Nice. Now the Hornet time, I've got about 300 hours of the F-18, A, B, C, D, and about 12 hours in the Super Hornet. I got an ATOPS call. Yep. Oh, that's it? <laughs> well, because we got, uh, well, let's go back. So I'm flying the F-14 all the way to the dirty end. I was the maintenance officer for VF-213 on the very last deployment on the Theodore Roosevelt. What a great tour that was. I tell you, it was absolutely amazing. Really? We finished that. We came back, and then we transitioned to the Super Hornet. The first, uh, I believe it was Lot 28, the first one with the ESA radar, the two-seat F-18Fs. And so I got to go fly the F-18 ENF as part of that transition. But, you know, at that point, it no longer made sense to give me flight hours because they were expensive Yeah. because I was leaving. I had orders and it was like, hey, sorry, Crunch, have a seat. And oh, by the way, here's some paperwork. Why don't you do that for us? Because we're going to go fly. <laughs> and it was like, awesome. You're the best skipper yeah, ever. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm serious. I'm kidding. That is kind of how the conversation yeah. went, though. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so I flew uh, the F all those Tomcats and, and the Hornets. How many Tomcat hours? I think it was like 2,300. Oh, wow. Is it true that at the very, very end, like you were talking about, like you guys were super high uh, mission sortie completion because you had all the parts as everybody else went away? Oh, my God, yeah. On that last deployment, this was crazy. <laughs> I should pull out my logbook. In that last deployment, we had all the parts support. We had all the support of Fighter Wing from the East Coast that we could possibly get. It's like, hey, you need an engine? Great. You'll have it on Tuesday. <laughs> there was no waiting for stuff. And we were flying so much that I had, in four months, each one of those months, I think the low month was like 76 hours. And I had a 90, Holy cow. I even had like a 95-hour month or something, something like amazing so much that i'm like that's even a lot for an airline pilot right <laughs> yeah. this well is that doesn't count that's not really flying <laughs> you had more in the 76 hour month by the way than i had my whole last year in the navy well prior to that i had never even flown more than like 33 hours in a month it just wasn't a thing right it yeah. was absolutely yeah. amazing all right, Crunch. Well, we can wrap this up. Uh, I think you already told us what the future holds for you. Sounds like you're going to sit around and not do anything for a while, huh? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. We're going to see. I just did my 18-month jet pride this last weekend. All went well, so that was good. I'm still flying. What an incredible time this is. Hopefully things improve. And our last question on the show, as always, is how did someone come up with Crunch for Craig Snyder? And I'm actually looking forward to this because even though I've known your call sign for mm. 25 years, I'm not sure I ever knew how you got it. Well, crunch is a Navy slang for fender bender, right? So mm -hmm. here I was, my second flight in the Tomcat. So we go out, we man up, and I got a pilot in the back seat because the first two flights you fly with a pilot in the back seat instead of a Rio. Right. Now, there's no flight controls in the back seat of a Tomcat. Yeah, but he can yell at you. Yeah, but he, yeah, right. And they put a pilot back there just so they could say, hey, you know, you're doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> but uh, but you got to go. You got to do it in the simulator good enough that they trust you and then they go fly with you. Right. You're the man. The first flight. It's kind of like being single seat. In case. So we get out there and it's my second flight and uh, we go to taxi out. And of course, you know, the wings in a Tomcat, they sweep. Right. Right. And at Oceana, we would instead of parking 90 degrees on the line, you would park about, you know, 30 to 40 degrees at an angle because it allows you to put them closer together with the wings and oversweep and to spread the wings without hitting the next airplane, right? Well, the airplane to my left, which I flew the day prior on my FAM-1, had the wings out in 20 degrees because they were doing some maintenance on it. There was guys on the top of the airplane working on it. And my airplane was in oversweep back at 33 degrees of oversweep. Well, or I'm sorry, uh, 72 degrees, which is 33 feet wide. Okay. Well, I did not realize how wide 33 feet is. And I didn't know that you could not see your wingtip in oversweep. 
So we start taxiing out. The airplane next to me, of course, is at 20. And so what you have to do is he's on my left. The wings are at 20. So he's kind of to my left and in front. And you have to take a jog to the right to create some space, then back to the left to swing your tail around so that you don't hit either airplane on your left or your right and you come out. It's very, you do it every day. It's no big deal. Well, the plane captain is directing me and I follow the direction of the plane captain and I don't really communicate with the guy back. And we all of a sudden we're like, oh, oh shoot, I'm touching wingtips with the other guy. So we come to a stop. <laughs> Everybody comes running. Everybody comes looking at us and they, they plug in the headset, you know, because you had the, the plane cap and everybody, they could plug their headset into the wheel well so you could talk to them on a the microphone and they plug in. They go, hey, uh, it looks like your, uh, your wingtip's just touching. We're going to taxi you clear. And I'm like, taxi is clear? <laughs> How is that going to work? <laughs> but are you sure? Yep, it's going to work. Okay, so here we go. So we taxi forward. And so sure enough, I create a big old racing stripe down my front slat with a wingtip of the other airplane. I'm like, oh, my Lord, how awful is that? So it's all bent up on the other airplane. And I'm like, good Lord. <laughs> well, now we are clear. So now we taxi out. We just taxi out and come all the way back around to a spot we were in before and park it. Yeah. And we're like, oh, my Lord, this is awful. Now the whole rest of the maintenance department is descending on the airplane. They all come out and look at it. The chief comes out. He looks at it. He's talking to the master chief back at the desk. And he looks at it. And he, they kind of look at it. And they talk about it amongst themselves. And they look up at us. They don't even plug up. They look at us. The chief points at me, gives me a thumbs up, and then the go fly signal. And I'm like, <laughs> huh. And so I talked to the guy in the back. I'm like, hey, man, what do you think? And he goes, well, I don't know. What do you think? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you I think? I'm brand new. I don't know. <laughs> so he goes, hold on. I'm going to ask. So he calls base. This is base. This is us. This is what happened. What do you think? And base comes back with, well, I don't know. What do you think? And then they front, <laughs> over, over the voice of God coming over the radio, the master chief from Maine, it's, take the jet, it's good. So we're like, all right, well, like, all right, so we'll take the jet. So we go up, we go, we taxi out, you know, we just basically ran into another airplane, put a little racing stripe down it. We go up, we're flying, we're like doing high altitude, doing mock runs, and come back, we land. And we're thinking about it afterwards going, man, we, we probably shouldn't have done that. Right. <laughs> and uh, so we, we come back and, uh, the other guy, he looks at me, he says, hey, Craig, he goes, now, when you go in there, you're going to have to write up a math, a maintenance action form. You're going to have to write it, write up a math. And I want you to think real hard before you write it up, because whatever you write, you're probably going to get a call sign out of it, and you're going to get stuck with it for the rest of your life. I'm like, whatever. Boom. Crunch it is. <laughs> <laughs> Been there ever since. That's Grem and Ironworks right there, baby. It is. Yep, oh, that's dear. Right. Yeah, well, that's one of those, you know, we have a lot of call sign stories on the show, and so many of them are based on names or uh, late movies, you know, recent movies like Blue or Bluto or yeah, something. Yeah, right. But anyway. Yeah, mine is through my own incompetence. That's where it's from, my own incompetence. <laughs> oh, you got to blame it on the guy in the back seat. What are you talking about? Uh, it, well, uh, <laughs> yes, right. That's exactly. That's right. Yeah, I stopped doing that a know. long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> oh man well you are still the character i remember crunch this has been a lot of fun if we can do this right i want you to come back next episode so we can finish our iads discussion i love it with the talk on sam's does it sound good i love it i can't wait to come back this sounds great all right man thanks jello appreciate the time thanks for the invite all right. Thanks a lot, Crunch. We'll see you next week for Sam's on part two. But yeah, like you said, Boat, at the beginning, that was a lot of fun. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely a good time. You guys clearly know each other and uh, have had some uh, good times in the past, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were uh, cross paths quite a few times. And every time we see each other at a reunion or Tailhawk or something, it's always a great time catching up. But uh, let's fill in, though, a few gaps. Now, first off, I think we jumped right to it. But there's a push underway, as I understand, to change the official terminology of this from AAA or anti-aircraft artillery to air defense artillery, which at least in the Army has its own terminology and meaning and understanding. But what would you say, uh, Boat, as we kind of think about this discussion today? Is there like a technical definition that we kind of glossed right over a little bit? Yeah, I think there's a few you know different ways you could describe this if you're just conceptually thinking about it off the cuff. But kind of per the definition here with a, their weapons designed to attack aircraft that commonly have a high rate of fire and are able to fire shells designed to damage aircraft. Okay. And they're also capable of firing at high angles, but are also usually able to hit ground targets as well in a direction or in a direct fire role. So kind of the way I think about it, you've got aircraft in this specific instance, thinking anti-aircraft mm -hmm. style, you've got low, medium, and high altitude aircraft or targets from the triple a batteries perspective so i know there was a, at one point in there a discussion on lad and it's 
Lima Alpha Alpha Delta low altitude air defense. Okay. And those are the battalions on the ground that are shooting at aircraft that are low altitude. So you're thinking helicopters, maybe some drones, A-10s uh, in a ground attack aircraft or something like that, or, or even fast aircraft going through valleys and those kinds of things. So those are the low altitude. As the size of the round that they are firing goes up, you can think that kind of coincides with the higher the altitude of the target, specifically because it needs sure. more propellant to go higher. So those are the kinds of things that I would kind of fill in the gaps there with uh, that specific definition. Yeah. Well, and I think to the point of the definition that you read, in other words, when I think of a military unit like an Army or Marine Corps artillery battalion, you see those great big, let's say, 105 millimeter howitzers. Yeah. Well, my guess is, although I'm no expert on it, I don't think they can point those straight up. Now, they can obviously point them up enough to lob them in for ground support. Mm -hmm. But I guess the idea of certain guns, like you might see in a movie where you've got the two guys uh, that each have wheels, they're cranking, yes, right? Yep. And then you've got a guy who's kind of aiming and or pointing broadly to the aircraft. And so the idea is that they can fire these things almost directly straight up Correct. Or, yep. or maybe even directly straight up. But as we talked about in the interview, of course, there's a challenge with that because it's going to come back down at some That's point right. now the likelihood of being hit by your own round is pretty low but it, it is still a, a threat to infrastructure and whatever Definitely. were we close on the different categories i want to say there's what small arms and then light medium and heavy uh, i don't remember any of the sizes was that something you were able to dig out of your noggin yeah i was trying to think of where the ranges were for those things and i did look online and i couldn't point to one specific thing that was for sure based off of what I remember going through training wise, the range. But I think the listener probably can grasp the whole concept of, hey, some guy running around the ground with an AK-47, that's just small arms fire. Mm -hmm. Light is a no kidding fixed kind of thing, whether it's fixed on a truck or fixed on a fixed site, i.e. doesn't have wheels on it. You're looking at the small diameter types of weapons. And then you go to the medium and you're probably in that 40 to 90-ish millimeter range. And then anything above 90 is generically where I would think it starts to get to that heavy artillery kind of size. And so mm -hmm. that's the best I could come up with. I looked around, I didn't see anything for sure that those define the ranges. Well, we don't have access to the information we used to have, yeah. but if we did, it would probably be classified anyway. Yeah. But some of this is available on the open net. And so folks can go do their own searching. But so for example, we did talk about a couple systems and I learned that the S60 as uh, Crunch identified it, is in fact the 57 millimeter. He wasn't sure. And it looks like it's been around since 1950, so 70 years. And again, these things are simple and widely proliferated, and that's why they're such a big threat. And the ZSU-23 TAC-4 has been around since 1960. Evidently, those things have a combined rate of fire, so each gun is about 1,000 rounds a minute, so about 4,000 rounds per minute. And it's mobile. So to your previous point, that thing can get around and shoot a high rate of fire. And if you're down down, rooting around, either if you're a helicopter or a fighter who's down low, that can be a real threat. I can remember that being one of the primary AAA kind of learning points that we had going through training and stuff. So it's definitely a real thing. And you talked about the time period when these things were created. That's, you know, 50 to 70 years ago. And those things are still around. I mean, they don't go away necessarily <laughs> unless the war zone ends, but you go to Afghanistan or whatnot, they're probably still firing some of that stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, just keep it clean and it should continue to function as long as you can get ammo for it. But that's right. Anyway, so let's see. We talked about the different types of fire aimed and barrage and curtain. You already talked a little bit more about the friendly AAA, if you will. There's, of course, a lot of advancements out there in radar and rate of fire. I've even had uh, one of our Patreon supporters send me a link the other day because he was able to listen to this early as one of his perks. And he sent me a link of a video that showed a round going through and at the very end of the barrel travel, it was basically programmed to have a little information extra uh, as Crunch identified, like the barometric information or the time of flight, stuff like that. Yeah. So I know there are some pretty cool advancements out there, but you know, in the F-16, you guys have aircraft dedicated to next week's topic on SAMs, but much discussion for you guys on AAA other than just try to avoid it? Yeah. I mean, I think avoidance is probably the primary method. And I know you guys, you and Crunch didn't really get into tactics to avoid beyond the generic fly through it quickly or avoid the area in general. But there are some differences for sure between what altitude you're executing maneuvers against people firing at you from the ground, specifically guns. And 
the most you know obvious ones are probably stay away from it and fly fast and everything, but use the terrain to your advantage. So you talked about going through valleys and everything. Well, if you just have a mountain between you and the gun, we'll just find the other side of the mountain. There's no way those bolts are getting through. Um, and then <laughs> sure. it kind of is the same for the dog fighting discussions we've had here on the podcast in the past where, you know, those guns at the end of the day are just a gun. And like crunch had mentioned, once the bullet comes out of the barrel, it's going wherever it was pointed. If there's no change of flight path along the way. And so as long as you, as the pilot in the aircraft avoiding these things, as long as you one can see it again, lose sight, lose fights, that's step number one. Mm -hmm. But as long as you can see it and you can threat react appropriately, then you're going to have success as long as you get out of plane, out of range and out of uh, the lead that the anti-aircraft gun is pulling on you. Yeah. And so one of those uh, things, the brevity term here is gun. And so as a wingman, you've got a visual scan pattern lookout to help protect uh, your flight lead. And typically this is in a low altitude environment because you're not going to really probably see too much in the way of AAA fixed sites or any sort of actual weaponry if you're at uh, medium or high altitude. But if you're in the low altitude environment, you just pick one up visually, uh, you just call out gun with a direction and hopefully at that point your uh counterpart there your wingman is going to be able to pick them up and start threat reacting accordingly if they are shooting and you guys cover tracers out there but as in terms of other ways that they pick you up and try to shoot you down you've got the radar guided uh gun sights you've got optically guided gun sights and those aren't going to give you a an indication until they start shooting at you so those are that's right things that are uh, going to be factors for you definitely in the low altitude environment for sure wow okay and then his call sign story was pretty crazy. I don't think taking a jet out after a scrape like that would fly these days, pun intended, but that was pretty crazy. Outside of maybe like you've got a no-fail mission and you're the only aircraft that's loaded up and ready to go at that moment, I think you're pretty much stuck on the ground at that point. <laughs> My goodness, yeah, no, that's definitely not going to fly in the Air Force. Especially, uh, dare I say, these more delicate jets these days. Uh, you know, they didn't call it Grumman Ironworks for nothing. <laughs> so uh, those F-14s were beefy. And of course, that's part of the mystique and all that of an F-14 in general. Oh, but anyway, thanks again, uh, Crunch. And we'll see you next week, hopefully, if everything works out. And both thanks for adding some extra information to that. As such, we can begin wrapping up. And, you know, we got some business to cover here. First, we want to thank our new Patreon strike lead, Alan Richardson, and a new air boss, the Pale Horse Gameplay folks have supported the show. We appreciate that. The views expressed in this presentation are the personal views of the hosts and our guest and do not necessarily represent the position of the Department of Defense or its components. So, Boat, always a pleasure. We'll catch you back here in November for Bomber Month, buddy. Sounds great, Jell. I can't wait for everybody to hear everything. It's going to be awesome. Yeah, it certainly is. All right. And for everyone else, you know what's next. Part two of our surface-to-air threats and counter tactics as we turn to our discussion to Sam's surface-to-air missiles with a guest who dodged a few one night over Baghdad. Don't miss it. We'll see you. You've been listening to the Fighter Pilot Podcast, brought to you by BVR Productions. Got a question for the show? Send an email to questions at fighterpilotpodcast.com or leave a message on our listener line at 877-MACH-101. That's 877-622-4101. Check us out at our website, fighterpilotpodcast.com. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. For exclusive Fighter Pilot Podcast content, check out our Patreon page. Please like, follow, and subscribe to the show. And don't forget to share us with your network. Thanks for listening.